świadczeniach, jeżeli chodzi o wdrażanie, ale przede wszystkim także i pracę z beneficjentami, czyli też... Lecture or presentation. So, can we see Francesco? Yes, I Hello, hear very well. Do you? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, yes of course. Well, nice. So, Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy uh, to stay here virtually, even though virtually. And I would be, I would be very interested to, you know, to show my brief presentation about um, the um, inter-organizational cooperation. With the with the emphasis on the innovative forms and their benefits, you see my screen, right? The yes. presentation. Okay, cool. So briefly presenting, I'm I'm uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University of Eastern Finland. My main focus is about border regions uh, from a, a perspective which combines innovation economics and spatial planning. I've been working uh, throughout uh, U.S. and Europe analyzing case studies in both continents. Today, I will speak about, um, uh, we start to, to talk about a little bit about innovation and how the open innovation backdrop has been influencing our, uh, our society, our economies during the last decade. Starting from the, you know, considering innovation and uh, how cooperation can be conducive to innovation, I would like to uh, think about that, uh, remind that, you know, the, at firm level, the, innov the innovative capacity of firm level depends primarily on the process of knowledge creation. Recently, this process is, not, is no longer an internal process, but can be open to, you know, to a collaborative network of, um, of organization, which makes the case for innovation open. So we will discuss later the drivers for innovation, recalling some of the, the you know, the basic concept uh, in um, economic geography. And then we will start to talk about the territorial impact in the inter-organizational cooperation, taking some insights from the North American borderlands that I've been assessing since three years. So again, my switch would be to between the Mm, the closed innovation principles and the open innovation. So we switched from a main exploitation of uh, main uh, research and development produced within the same firm, while uh, while exploiting the uh, the knowledge freely circulating across different uh, different industries, uh, governments, uh, academics, and, dif and different research institutions. So we switch from a, a closed uh, process while to now is more awarded a, pro a process where we are uh, embedding external knowledge into our business models. Um, so the pursuit of co-creation, uh, which has been heavily encouraged by European Union, so we, we passed from the, uh, the knowledge transfer can seen as a major tool for open innovation, which, uh, which was relying mostly on bringing what is outside in terms of knowledge and bringing in to a couple process. Uh, so uh, freely circulating knowledge in and out of uh, our firms and conducing to the building of platform which would engage, uh, you know, even innovation users and innovation makers into one broad ecosystem to create new uh, innovation. This is the case, for instance, of the extended user smartphones, which has changed customer behaviors and fostered opportunities for further innovation. So we moved basically with Open Innovation 2.0, we moved from, from bilateral cooperation and collaboration with multi-collaborative innovation ecosystem. 
uh, how we explain if two territories or two firms cooperate each other. We, we should recall a little bit the proximity framework that has been developed in 2005 by Ron Boschman and the School of Utrecht, uh, which uh, recognized that this five dimension of proximity clearly uh, shapes the opportunity and the, the uh, likability that two firms or two organizations or two territories can cooperate each other. One is about geographical proximity, which mainly refers to physical distance. Mm. The other one is about cognitive proximity, which mainly refers to knowledge base and expertise that, has and that are um, very rooted in uh, some territories, for instance. We will talk uh, later on this. The institutional proximity refers to the set of rules, laws, and actions which, which uh, encourage collective actions. While social um, proximity talks about, uh, mainly refers to the, to the embeddedness of um, agents at micro level. Interorganizational proximity uh, refers to the membership of two or different departments into one large en uh, enterprise. So this proximity framework, which will explain the firm, uh, the firm uh, attitude and the firm cooperation or interorganizational cooperation has, has been translated also in the territories. But uh, now we'll talk a little bit more about the, um, sorry, the, the, the firms. So taking into account only the firm perspectives, uh, what drives firm to cooperate? It's not philanthropy, of course, but it's more about economic value added. So uh, firms look for, uh, of course, profit. So, um, but we can see that uh, expertise such as cognitive proximity, so the expertise, the knowledge base, and the networks are very pivotal for them to cooperate each other to create more innovation. But uh, out of the scheme of, uh, of Boschma, there is also the trust, which is uh, very important be because it's uh, considered as one of the basic co requirements for successful cooperation in inter-organizational relationships. So um, if you think about uh, proximity and knowledge base as a concept, uh, as a theoretical concept, uh, they hint at the spatial level, so they hint at uh, uh, the territory as um, very important element for inter-organizational cooperation towards innovation. Definitely governance shapes these three elements with the role of territorial cooperation. So adopting a very uh, well-known uh, spatial uh, approach to innovation, which is the regional innovation ecosystem, which spearheaded the the debate in uh, innovation economies in Europe since uh, 2013, the concept distinguishes from, from different um, uh, other concepts such as regional innovation system, for instance, for awarding a dynamic, agile, and mainly self-governed network structure. So a bottom-up approach which allows local actors to, uh, to be embedded in a multi-level perspective. These local actors can be definitely the, the um, the, the, the ones collected in the quintuple helix approach. And this makes the case for a network culture with many collaborative actors operating with different roles and responsibilities. My analysis have been uh, oriented to two different border regions in, uh, in North America. The first one is the, the so-called Cascadia border region, which stretches along the US and Canadian border in the Pacific Northwest. It is house of large innovation hubs or powerhouses, which are Seattle, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Portland. And it serves a, as a main gateway for Asia. We considered here to measure the proximity, uh, the different dimension of proximity in the region. So we, we collected info and data about the main important economic cluster in the regions. Uh, important for uh, eco employment. So the, the, the cluster, the industry sector where there were the most employment data. And we can see here a clear overlap of knowledge base from the two sides of Seattle and Vancouver. Um, in the same way, we process this data about publications, which are very important uh, proxy for innovation in a technological, in technological perspective. 
So you can see he also here from the two sides of the border, a clear homophily from the two sides. Despite that, we consider that to assess the, the social proximity as a proxy for success of inter-cooperation cross-border. And we consider that the cascading, the cascading innovation ecosystem is not yet that powerful as it should be for the premises. Despite that, they are growing uh, their institutional proximity with two MOUs uh, memorandum of understanding between uh, British Columbia government and Washington state government signed in 2016 and renovated two years later. Uh, this partnership uh, is Cascade Innovation Corridor, which is a public private um, initiative, which aims at reconnecting the accessibility of the region, building the first high speed train cross border in North American cont continent and also driving development in the, in, the, in the main areas that you can see here, which are mainly technological areas where the region does have powerful R&D assets. What is innovative in Cascadia Innovation Corridor? First of all, it is um, the role of multinational enterprises as brokers, which is totally different than Europe. As you can see here, you can find of the, the most connected university and the, the most connected organization that we found in the region are Microsoft, Boeing, Amazon, uh, which are driving very much the, the, the development of this initiative. Um, along the way, uh, also the, in different NPOs worked uh, hardly to create, you know, uh, conditions for more innovation in the region, such as uh, the, the universities and also the Business Council of British Columbia. The, the Cascade Innovation Corridor distinguishes also for addressing highly perceived societal challenge as the cancer treatment. And also a remarkable asset, a remarkable feature of this initiative regards the fact that it drives development at economic perspective, but also at planning perspective. So speaking a little bit about the Cascadia Data Alliance, it, it is a collaborative effort funded by Microsoft uh, with as many other collaborative efforts in the region. And it focuses on cancer treatment um, and it works uh, together with uh, the two important research centers in both sides of the border focusing on oncology. Hymens are, are at uh, a very breakthrough cooperation in regional development uh, about oncology and data exchange about treatment equations, which will make, you know, which will pave the way for substantial progress on cancer treatment in the region and with a global resonance. Switching to the second, uh, to the second uh, border region I assessed uh, is about the southwestern American border between San Diego and Tijuana across the, uh, the US Mexican border. The area has been considered the busiest land border in the Western world. Since 2008, it has been marketed through the Calibaca Mega Region Initiative. Here we consider the networks. The innovative networks can be viewed as cooperative relationship between companies and other actors, such as governments, planning agencies, and NPOs. Here you can see that we, uh, uh, through the social network analysis, we consider pivotal the university's role as uh, boosting innovation on both sides of the border. On the Mexican side, still the public actors play a stronger role. Planning agencies uh, from the two cities of San Diego and Tijuana also work very um, well in the region and are very connected in the regional innovation ecosystem as they are trying to, you know, to drive investments on infrastructure on the two sides of the border under a common vision. <clears throat> We, we, we saw to the bank a little bit the, organ the, the role of organization in the, in the, in the regional innovation ecosystem. Uh, and we found out that networking activities and participating at binational events are very crucial for building trust and um, heightening the, 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 the knowledge about opportunities on the other side of the border. All actors seem very um, engaged with training activities or mentor activities or joint research projects uh, to increase the level of competitiveness on both sides of the border. 
uh, institutional actors on the two sides of the border collectively and together work to influence the agenda on federal governments, both in Washington and Mexico City, to create the condition to, uh, to gain more and more investments in the area. We sought also to, you know, to develop a little bit the, 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 you know, the profile of role of organization in the regional innovation ecosystem. And we could see that <clears throat> universities from America, from San Diego, engaged very much with the, um, with the Mexican students and Mexican universities to teach and to train <clears throat> their students. And, and also through pitch competitions that are basically you know, invite, inviting a young entrepreneurs from both sides of the border to develop a business idea, which can eventually lead to a, a startup creation. Advising and mentoring entrepreneurs on both sides of the border, collaborative, um, collaborative work together to create conditions for business on two sides. Basically, San Diego works as a point of entry for Mexicans, for the, um, the US large market, while Tijuana serves as the hotbed for innovation in uh, Latin growing market, Latin America, which is a growing market. So scouting new business on the other side of the border is also pivotal for the, uh, for the organization on both sides. So um, I, I, I try to, to conclude with um, recalling a little bit the different roles. So municipality is, uh, municipalities on, those, on two sides of the border work together to create the framework where other actors work together on the two sides of the border. Events are, are, um, are um, considered crucial to create uh, trust and cooperation. Lobbying at federal level and marketing the region as a whole, as Calibaja, is still attracting many uh, investments from corner. So the so-called foreign, foreign dining investments. And university officials are trying to do their best to understand their role to, you know, to give their contribution to the innovation landscape across the board. The final slide is about conclusions. Uh, so we can see here that positive, there is a positive association between inter-organizational cooperation and organizational innovativeness. Both cross-border regions strive to be global tech hubs. Local policy networks, that despite you know, very hard times in policy in, uh, at federal level, are supportive to cross-border cooperation toward innovation. Private actors and MPOs are pivotal in driving innovation in cross-border region. Proximity framework, as we could see also in Cascadia, and as I wrote in a couple of articles that have been published, proximity framework can explain preconditions for cross-border innovation, but, but multi-level governance is essential. Trust is crucial for building solid cooperation relationships. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Do you have Fra questions? Thank you, Francesco. It was really uh, interesting case studies giving uh, insights both on cross-border and inter-organizational cooperation. So, uh, Thank you. I, I suggest to continue in uh, such a way. Every panelist will have a couple of minutes to present himself and then to ask questions to your presentation and then to continue in to discussion following uh, the question I suggested, but of course not each question should be discussed. Uh, we will start uh, from the facts given by your presentation and according to the research interest, research experience and findings, each of the panelists and also the rest of the people who are attending this round table could uh, ask questions or make comments and share their experience. So who wants to be the first? We have people we are waiting this online. I would like to greet them that are uh, here, even visually. We can start uh, by the order given in the program, but also if somebody wants to be the first, I don't mind. I hope nobody will mind. Ladies first. Oh, lady. Anne Hoffman, I see. Uh, first in the screen, but also in the list. Hello. Thank you very much. <laughs> I cannot hear you very well, so I just answer your question. I hope you asked me to present myself. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Hoffman from the Euro Institute. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this roundtable today. Uh, I try to be very brief. The Euro Institute is a um, cross-border institute at the German-French border, and we work in different fields to facilitate cross-border cooperation by trainings, by project accompaniment and consulting, and also uh, doing um, research in different fields. Um, we are also coordinating a network of uh, different institutions that work on cross-border cooperation um, across Europe. So um, we have 50 members now at nine different borders and three associated members. And uh, the VSB University is one of them, so we're very proud <laughs> to have them in the network. And uh, the idea really is to bring together um, different institutions, so uh, to cooperate, so uh, cooperate inter-organizational. Um, but we don't cooperate with any companies, so just to make that clear from the beginning. <laughs> and I, do, I did appreciate very much your presentation, uh, Mr. Capilano, because I think a lot of points you made is, are very, very true also for uh, inter-organizational cooperation, even if we don't uh, talk about companies, for example, but uh, we see very much that bringing together research institutes, universities, and training institutes, for example. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's along the same lines that you just presented, and it's very, very fruitful uh, work together. And I look very much forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Any question to Dr. Capuano? Dr. Hoffman, do you have any question to Dr. Capuano? No, Perhaps thank so. you. Not at the moment. <laughs> OK, thank you. Then I think it's Magdalena okay. uh, to present herself. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Magdalena Stus. I'm from Jagiellonian University, uh, Krakow. Uh, I would like to take about three examples of inter-organization cooperation. Uh, first, last week we finished a large project uh, with uh, seven uh, Polish university, 18 researchers. Uh, it was only one word, innovation for. What do you think about management, what, uh, different kinds of management, about in innovation part four, so uh, we finished this research, we finished monography, I have an uh, article about human resource management, about knowledge management, about university management, I think it's the most important cooperation between different parts, it first, first part about na our research, uh, we finding problems in this position, innovation for, so I, I'm very happy uh, we finish and we can go another part of research. It's one example. Second example is mine individual because uh, my specific is human resource management and uh, I uh, prepare monograph about talent management so I have a lot, I, I, I had a lot of problems to talk about talent management with, with small business. I have only research, it's cooperation between small business in this problem, it's talent management, I think it's no. Uh, we talk only, we have uh, research only in large cooperation, international cooperation, and, and, and I think it's problem to cooperation in small business. And for, uh, third uh, example, in the last is about my uh, cooperation. I think it's 20 years with my friend from uh, Greenwich University, London. We have a formal cooperation, we're only friends, but after these 20 years, we have a lot of projects, a lot of uh, publications, and only us cooperation between us. Our university, Jagiellonian University and Greenwich University, haven't any formal cooperation, and only, I think it's uh, uh, most important also so form of cooperation. And I have, uh, also sorry, uh, to Francesco uh, one question, because uh, one of the first slides you have innovation part two. Uh, do you think it above this problem? And what do you think another answer of this idea you presented us? Hello, good morning. Thank you for the questions. 
I didn't get very much the question, unfortunately. The second, the second slide was about what? I think uh, uh, I would like to ask you about another aspect, after aspect of your research, for, because you see innovation part two in f one of the first slides, and I ask about innovation three, innovation four part of this problem. Maybe why did? Mm. What do you think will be next research of these aspects for you? What ah, we are okay, present? Okay. okay, maybe like this. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Well, definitely, I would like to see what the civic engagement is in the in the innovation. We are talking a lot about innovation uh, driven by public actors, which is kind of you know obvious. And we're talking also about innovation made up by uh, or leveraged by universities or research center. But what is the impact on the um, civil society, especially in the border regions, which are some, uh, you know, they have uh, good opportunities to, you know, to have uh, uh, to have remarkable R&D assets uh, in the global economies, but have also a deficit in uh, in uh, in public services. So uh, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, my next point would be what is the, uh, the, the impact on innovation for civil society at the border regions? Okay, thank you. And now it's turn Dr. Silvia Georgieva to present herself and if she has questions to ask. Hello, uh, my name is Silvia Georgieva. I'm fr from Bulgaria. I work in uh, Institute of Entrepreneurship uh, in uh, University for National and World Economy. My research interests include um, entrepreneurship, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, uh, for example, uh, women and uh, art and creative entrepreneurship, um, I agree with Francesco about key role of uh, trust in our research, trust between partners from uh, two sides of the border is uh, crucial to uh, their uh, attitude. Do you ask questions? Okay, and uh, I see uh, now is uh, Miroslava Vin Vinciola. Uh, do I pronounce the name right, Miroslava? Hello. Uh, we yes, we yes, yes, I can. Now hear. we can hear you. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I am. Uh, my name is Miroslav Vincelov. I'm from uh, Faculty of Economics uh, of Matej Bell University in Banska Bystrica, Slovakia. And I am here also with my colleague Ladislav Clement uh, from our department. We wish you a good morning from Slovakia. Thank you. Good yes, and, and could, you please, could you please repeat the question? Because we, 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 we didn't have. Uh, Okay, uh, now it's just to present yourself and if you have ah. any questions to Dr. Capellano to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very briefly, we are, we are from Department of Corporate Economics and Management and uh, we are participating here because uh, not recently, but let's say a few years ago, we made a research about the clusters, technological clusters in, in the Slovakia. And uh, as, you, as you probably know, the cluster is also the kind of cooperation or intercompany cooperation. And uh, so as we saw the presentation of Mr. Capellano, it, it, was, it was great. And, and we have uh, almost the same outcomes and findings from, from our research. And probably the question could be, uh, um, have you experienced, as, as we did, uh, that, uh, let's say, the big or dominate companies uh, which are cooperating uh, with each other or with small and medium-sized enterprises, many times they are, um, they are using the dominant position and they are pushing the small partners uh, to agree with almost everything uh, they need to achieve. 
in, in the strategy, in the goals and activities they are providing? Yes, absolutely. I found that the same thing uh, in, uh, in Cascadia, where they have a low cooperation degree, according to my research, and also according to the um, interviews I had uh, with many key stakeholders. And over there, you know, I remember an interview that from one, uh, uh, from one business organization in Vancouver that was saying, why should I should cooperate with uh, Amazon or Microsoft, they are too large for me to, to cooperate. So I'd prefer to, co to cooperate with my same sites or same, you know, uh, same kind of business rather than to be acquired by, you know, by a large giant, tech giant. So definitely is a matter of sites in the business for being cooperated. But this is hints at the same time at the, uh, you know, at the paradox between uh, between the two sides of the border, because we, we as firms or, or you know, co organization, we look for always for homophily, so for same thing, same, same characteristics to cooperate with the partners with same characteristics of us, but then mainly too much similarity is, is detrimental for innovation. So there is a balance, you know, that there is something to learn from each other. Uh, so if you are too, too much similar, maybe there's not too much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. interested in research though. And now uh, I see the first uh, among the men, Slavomir Oku, Professor Oku from... You will present. Thank you very much. Thank you for invitation. Uh, First question, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so let me introduce myself in a few words. And uh, yes, I've got a question to Professor Capellano. Um, I work for the Silesian University of Technology, dealing with the problems of innovation management. So all the problems of cooperation uh, I'm familiar with, and uh, this is the crucial element of uh, networking innovation. Uh, recently, I just made some research on using standards uh, of innovation management. Uh, this year, uh, the International Organization of Standardization uh, Organization just published the standard uh, for innovation management. And this is connected with my question to Professor Capellano. Hey, how you see the role of standards and a cooperation between uh, different entities, different businesses, uh, transnational or transregional, uh, uh, is it something uh, useful or something that just can uh, collapse the cooperation? Okay, I'm not sure if you are asking about metrics for innovation itself or metrics for cooperation. Uh, In the I mean the role of standards. The technical okay. standards, not, not only because I mentioned the innovation management standards, so but uh, general uh, standards. Uh, for example, you point out the, the example of uh, Mexico-United States cooperation. They mm -hmm. use the same standards, or they, they collaborate the, the joint standards, and uh, what is the role of standards in this okay. cooperation? Uh, I have to say that I'm not very super familiar with this, uh, the issue of the standard, but uh, from what I learned in the field is about that, of course, there are some barriers uh, because of not only the standards, but also because of cross-border issues. So it's not easy, for instance, for Americans to invest in Mexican companies. Actually, it's very rare. It's more easier, for instance, to, do the, to see those uh, investments uh, especially in the startups on the Canadian side, because uh, a matter of a uh, couple of issues like trust. People, of course, tend to, to trust less Mexican and maybe also the language works as a barrier. But um, yeah, standards can be detrimental in the way if they are too much, you know, detailed, then it's, it's an obstacle, like any administrative burden, but also can be, I mean, can be a good, a, a good medium to leverage innovation, to conducive innovation, because they can streamline some procedures. Uh, and 
another case that uh, comes to my mind is the, the joint patent that um, in the matter of oncology that the two research centers made up. And of course, it's easier to register and deliver more, more, more fruitful to register a patent in the US, but it's definitely harder to do so in, uh, in, other, in other countries from, for US companies because they are different protocols and standards, as you said. So it's a tricky, it's a, it's a tricky um, issue in the innovation management, I presume. Okay, is that all, Professor Oko? Thank you, thank you, yes. If yes, Professor Sebastian Kopt. Thank you. Uh, I will invite. Hello, everybody. I'm Sebastian Kopt. I'm working in Czestochowa University of Technology. As well, I'm working for Northwest University of Triangle, South Africa. So uh, let me ask one question for Professor Capellano. Is he with us still? Because I cannot see him in in the pictures? Yes, okay. Uh, hard question. Who pays for your research? No, 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 no. <laughs> Please do not answer. But yeah, it, it, it will be the question related to this. Uh, so it means who are, who, sorry, who is interested in the development of this collaboration towards the innovation development? Who is interested? Because, uh, okay, after the answer, I will continue my, uh, my thoughts. So, who is interested in the development of innovation collaborative networks uh, in the border region? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, the, in your research. Who is, who is interested? It means who pays for this or uh, what are the funds come from for this collaboration between businesses? Okay. Or, or it, is, it is their own initiatives, okay, we would like to collaborate, it is natural for them, or it is from the governmental, or from uh, some other offices, yeah, you need to collaborate because we've got money and so on. Okay, basically there are two different scenarios. Uh, federal government from 2016 is not putting too much money on cross-border cooperation, I feel. Yeah, at least in the US. So basically it's a matter of um, opportunity and threat. And how to, you know, to, to, to take you know, a threat uh, to an opportunity. So basically uh, on one side, the Canadian US side, especially because of the Trump decisions to, um, to harden the, the migration policies, Amazon, Microsoft and Boeing as many have many problems to hire international people in the US. So that's why they're opening their headquarters in Canada. And that's where they, are, they like to, the, I mean, they fund, especially Microsoft is funding millions of euros of dollars in uh, Cascadia Innovation Corridor to create an ecosystem which can be, you know, which can provide vibe to the region, can allow, you know, cross-border interactions, but also can be very fruitful for economic uh, benefits for them uh, because of course like networking and scouting and taking you know external knowledge as I said is, is a pivotal resource in the innovation economies especially in the backdrop of open innovation but also the fact that you can uh, hire people in Canada and make them working for US companies on the other side of on the other side so in California basically the issues that uh, they are both very detached from the rest of their countries. So San Diego is perceived as an island from, you know, from, the, from Washington and from the rest of California, and the same for Tijuana. So they are working together, uh, also leveraging some little funding, especially in the infrastructure, but they work together to improve their local of competitiveness. If they don't cooperate, they tend to be uh, they tend to, you know, to be um, neglected in the in the in the continental perspective. Uh, with, what does it mean? Of course, uh, UCSD, so big universities in uh, in San Diego, can can be definitely competitive uh, without any cooperation in Tijuana. But of course, they are taking, you know, advantages of their cooperation in Tijuana because they provide uh, creativity and they provide, you know some uh, local some uh, resources that are not easy to, to 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 have in us 
And uh, of course, again, it's about testing innovation in Tijuana if it works for the Latin American market, while for Mexican, of course, the benefit is to cooperate with the more innovative and more research and development asset in the US. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it was very informative. However, uh, it was a good direction for Polish business. Maybe we should open some headquarters in Ukraine to uh, hire good people for our uh, business in Poland. Yeah, but uh, I've got also another question. I apologize. I'm not, I, I have been never um, involved in uh, innovation development considering businesses but uh, I know the collaboration between academia. So I can see that we need also find some innovation in our relation and cooperation because of the COVID and, and this uh, limitation. So I think that maybe many of you can share my uh, ideas about it, but we are boring of traditional conferences, online conferences, when we are listening to the presentation, maybe some questions, some people are cooking during this time, some people are uh, taking care about the children, but yes, we are still online, and yeah, we are, uh, of, of course, we, we don't need to show the picture, so we can do anything but not participate actively in the conference. And I think that it is a little boring for us, uh, okay, we get certificate, but this collaboration are for me a little time wasting because it is not a real conference when we can meet, we can discuss. And drink. Okay, we can eat together, drink together, and it's also it is also related to the uh, organization. Sorry, it is also related to the. A development of, of uh, collaboration between organizations because we can have two types in my opinion first type is we are getting funds and we should do something with this so we are looking around what to spend the money for but in my opinion it is very weak type of collaboration the most strongest is as you said you have a very strong personal collaboration and the best benefits, there are collaboration based on people and after that organization. Because without real collaboration between people and between understanding, between them, between the same type of thinking and, and uh, uh, ideas about the world, I think that this collaboration between universities, in my example, can be death. I know many agreements without any development in relation to innovation, in relation to research and development, and that is the, the biggest problem. Okay, I'm finishing because we've got the time. So there is a kind of innovation in our relationships. Let me show. It is for academia, but maybe it will be useful also for, for the business. Because uh, yesterday we have been to a dinner we talked a lot, we were happy, we, uh, we talked about our travels in the past, where we have been, what we have done, and so on. And I can see this hunger for these tours, for this uh, online, sorry, for this real meeting face to face, and so on. So, unfortunately, we are still have a COVID, but we've got a small innovative solution. Together with my colleagues from Joburg University or Northwest University, we are organizing some special tour. Can you start, please? Okay, because as I told you, probably we are a little boring of traditional, traditional uh, online conferences. This is a special world tour, as you can see. And there will be no presentation, there will be no uh, PPT and so on. It is a special tour, world tour. We try to uh, collect people who would like to exchange our present situation, circumstances in relation to the limitation of COVID, in relation to our economy. We would like to talk each to other. And this is such kind of, in my opinion, innovative social innovative 
idea how to collaborate still, not to lose our links, our networks. Please, if you are interested, be so kind to write an email to Professor Natania Mayer. She will be happy to share with you with the Zoom uh, link and you can take part in our world tour to get more about what's going on in other countries without traveling, without, without the problem of COVID, still sitting in our kitchen, in our living rooms, but feeling uh, circumstances of other places. We used to travel a lot, but in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an interesting idea. I appreciate it, but I will make one note. You miss Bulgaria in the list. <laughs> but we will negotiate after no, the no, conference. This is, this is because of that. Here is the email to Natania Mayer. You can write to her some email and you will be the participant of that. Thank you. Now is uh, time, Professor Andrzej Zalewski, to present himself. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am an associated professor of architect, architecture and urban planning in uh, UTP uh, University of Science and Technology in Bydgoszcz. Uh, many years I spent in uh, design and consulting office, uh, DHV uh, Poland, Poland uh, was a division of DHV company from uh, Holland, Dutch. Uh, either I uh, many years uh, working in uh, 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 European Cyclist Federation, where we create a project concerning uh, Eurovelo, uh, uh, it is a, a trans European cycling, a tourism cycling network. Uh, I, uh, uh, in the base of my experience, I can say that organizational innovation may be a condition or and consequence uh, of inter-organizational cooperation aimed at technological uh, invitation. For example, uh, in uh, the DHV uh, company, I participate in Dutch-Polish uh, Polish Dutch uh, project in Puave, uh, medium size city, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, 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 Dutch town. We create uh, a new infrastructure for uh, improving uh, 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 road safety. Uh, the results uh, uh, of uh, achieved in this project confirm uh, my thesis that uh, uh, organizational in, uh, innovation uh, is a condition and consequence of interoperational uh, interorganizational cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if uh, there is no question to the presentation, I would invite. Uh, Andrius Puxas, if I pronounce, Professor Puxas. Uh, thank you, that's right. Uh, hope uh, everything is okay with uh, the voice. And uh, I need to apologize for about the starting uh, of my connection because you heard probably the, some noises uh, from other par part of computer. Uh, so uh, I'm Andreas Puxas, working uh, at the Nicolas Ramirez University in Vilnius, Lithuania. As well, I'm a member of uh, Central Electoral Commission. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm at the university. I'm working with legal issues, uh, legal issues uh, as well, including. Uh, cooperation between uh, the academia as well. Uh, currently, I'm working with the host institution on preparing uh, some research, uh, on providing some research activities uh, as well. The, uh, my fields of interest in co competition law, co-production, cooperation between the states uh, on different levels, and as well, uh, I'm interested uh, in that, not also on the 
theoretical level as well and practical because uh, Partly, I'm working with uh, policies uh, of my st state, uh, and uh, happy that uh, our cooperation with Poland is so successful uh, in the following years. Uh, so I'm just glad to be here to participate. And, uh, absolutely agree about uh, what was said before, including uh, the traditional conferences online. Uh, we can speak about the successful cooperation between the uh, uh, different subjects only when we are speaking about the people-based collaboration, not only institutional-based co collaboration. So thank you once again for inviting me, for providing the stage to share my thoughts about everything. So probably no questions for the people who are speaking before. Thank you once again. Thank you. And now it's time to pay attention to the question I was asked to formulate in advance to be distributed among panelists. Uh, when I uh, trying to formulate the question, I try to cover many aspects of interorganizational cooperation. Now we have no enough time to discuss question by questions, so I uh, would like to suggest to choose that aspect which are of common interest or at least of uh, the interest of the majority of panelists. So uh, one of the things is the relation between two kinds of innovation, organizational and technological. The other is uh, about the current challenges, having in mind, at first place, the COVID spread and the measures to restrict that spread. The other question is about the costs and benefits when we allow, at company level, our staff to spend some of the time to communicate with peer staff from the uh, partnering companies. The other is about the use of online tools that question was already uh, discussed, not discussed, but uh, mentioned in, uh, in suggesting an innovative way of knowing each other better to create uh, common research interest. The other is uh, about the relation between small and large-scale businesses, because it's a, a very hot topic in our country, especially when now we have uh, bigger contribution of small and neuroscience companies uh, than the, uh, comparing to other EU countries, but because they're mostly acting as subcontractors. And it's a dangerous strategy, even it solves some tactical questions. And the last is about capacity building while a company trying to manage uh, growth processes inside, that means should we have a special expert staff dedicated to that cooperation? So, uh, who wants to be the first uh, to choose one of those direction of uh, questions? And uh, to suggest what is uh, her or his views, uh, research findings, if any, and any suggestions about uh, future research avenues? Thank you. Wants to take phone. While you are thinking, I would add to the presentation of Dr. Francesco uh, Capellano two uh, very interesting cases about small business cooperation. We taught maybe almost 30 years our students, and as the regions of Emilia Romagna in Italy, a region not, not dominated by large company like Fiat or others, but with very good networks among uh, traditional manufacturing companies in furniture. It's also uh, almost the same, the uh, region of West Denmark, Jutland, the Herning-Kikas region, where they also have traditional manufacturing, not high-tech, but through cooperation, they were uh, able to do all the stages separated by different businesses from design to logistics and to make a competitive products for the world market. The example given about uh, US and Canada uh, focus mainly on the large enterprises. But I think 
that the Rio, including cross-border cooperation, should be based on entrepreneurs, independent entrepreneurs. Of course, they need some backbones to build infrastructure to use. It could be the authorities who manage state or city authorities that infrastructure. It could be also some major companies that makes the economic landmark of the region. But having opportunities to communicate, to know each other, to travel, to meet different events, fairs, conferences, congresses, to establish a real human-based network. And I think it's more vivid and surviving in hard times approach to cooperation, not formally designed by programs. We have experiences with our neighbors, Bulgaria, Serbia, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey. But everything finished when the money ended. And this is because still the people's connection are weak, especially with countries. We have historically uh, isolation for uh, getting uh, known each other. So, who wants to take the floor? Professor Kopp. Thank you very much. Let me comment something in relation to the collaboration towards the innovation, especially because we are mostly from academia. So, uh, I would like to pay your attention, especially Polish colleagues, on the one problem. Why in Poland we've got relatively lower number of project and generally uh, weaker collaboration between academia and between business towards innovation. Because I found in Hungary that they have v much more projects with the industry towards innovation, towards new ideas and so on. And at the beginning I thought maybe they are wiser Hungarian colleagues, and because of that, let's say Audi, because it is a real example, ask them about some solution, innovative solution for, for their business and so on. But I found that the key is completely different, the decision. I found that those businesses, they have a special discount from the tax if they collaborate with the academia and if they have innovative pro projects together. And because of that, it is a common business for the business and for the academia to collaborate and to find new innovative solution and to do developed innovation. In Poland, we have no such rules. And that is the problem because every of the businesses, they have their own research and development centers, they try to find innovative solution themselves, and they have no, I think, or very low interest to collaborate with academia. That's, that's the problem, and I think that we need to consider some, uh, some solution towards this idea. Of course, I'm very interested the examples of our co uh, other colleagues from Bulgaria uh, in, in, in this uh, relation from, from Czech Republic, maybe it's a different uh, situation. But in Poland, we've got this problem. And mostly if we have some project with the business, it is a little artificial. It's not the, the uh, real need and that they would like us to solve some problems. I, I say the same because I remember a few years ago we have in Krakow, Krakow is university city, so we have a lot of universities and academia, a project uh, innovation for small business. We have commission and uh, there was, there were uh, I think 10 or 11 applications from university and any one application for small business. Next year will be promotion, talking, uh, speakers, meeting about this uh, program. And uh, after this round, we have two applications from <laughs> small business. I think it's a lot of problem between, because university academy say, okay, we are ready to attend, but we have background 
and we don't work anything to have a background. So I think it's a problem for us. In my opinion, uh, to uh, other conditions, because first, in Poland, uh, generally, in my opinion, uh, are not uh, good uh, financial condition to collaboration between industry and universities. Uh, all universities are generally give uh, uh, very high prices for your uh, research. A second is a mentality, social problem because uh, uh, industry, see, uh, many people working in industry thinking that uh, people from university uh, haven't experience uh, in uh, pr practical experience in this mean uh, uh, contact uh, collaboration are relatively small. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the colleagues who are online in that round table, would you like to comment some of the questions given? May I take uh, the second uh, question? Yes, please. Uh, so, the question is how to, to deal with the problem or the challenge of international inter-organization cooperation. How can we overcome the, the, this problem? Uh, I think uh, one of the issues, maybe it's not the answer, the, the whole answer of the this challenge, but one of the issues is to uh, prepare a common language, especially uh, in terms of uh, innovation management. That's why I also ask about the, the standards. standards. I'm not going to die for the standards. However, if we consider the situation with, uh, for example, Oslo Manual, uh, in 2018 was the fifth edition of Oslo Manual, also, manual just provide the, the, the standards of uh, using the common language, how to, to understand innovation, uh, what is the process innovation, what is the, the product innovation. And this is very crucial uh, to, to deal with the, the social distance between the entities. What uh, was also uh, pointed out in uh, a Professor Capellano a presentation that, that we have some social distance and we have uh, the, the, some differences with, uh, and we can uh, understand each other in common language. So that's why uh, um, establishing uh, this language uh, using, yes, in the some, some standards, some, for example, certification. Uh, or a, a joint project when we just uh, uh, using the, the, this kind of uh, uh, common language, uh, this is very crucial. Uh, one final, um, final sentence. Uh, if we consider the situation in project management, in project management, they have established a project management body of knowledge, this, this Bible of project management, and all these project managers, they have, they understand each other. Doesn't matter, they are from South Africa, they are from uh, Russia, from the States or Europe. Uh, they just prepare this. I, I have uh, the experience, and I'm really committed that uh, in innovation and in management, everybody uses different language. And that's why we don't understand each other. And uh, this really don't uh, uh, help us, not helping us uh, with the uh, close, uh, make more proximate, uh, proximate each other. Uh, social distance is still, uh, still very high. Thank you. This is my contribution. Thank you. Who else wants to make a comment or? Maybe just on what you said, Mr. Oiko, if I may. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's very true what you said that um, the, the issue of common languages and that we speak about the same thing and um, that we understand each other. And I think also to come back to one of the proposals that had been made for, uh, for before is 
I think the current challenges we are in and we cannot travel anymore and we cannot chat over a cup of coffee and meet new people anymore in the current context. I think it's very important because what we noticed in our network, the Transfrontier Union Institute network, is that the cooperation works very well and we can continue very well with the people we already know, with which we have already built trust. And you have seen, seen, uh, said it as well, Mr. Cagliano, that is really, really important. And there we see that cooperation continues and we can, can continue, we can continue to work on projects and all of this. But the big challenge for us is how can we meet new people? How can we go out of our network and, you know, extend? And I think that is the question of language or the common language, because we don't have this common language with people that are outside our network, for example. And in the current context, you cannot just go, you know, as you said, okay, we can go to a conference online very well, but I can hardly, you know, Talk to, talk to you in private or, you know, have an informal kind of communication. And I think that is really one of the big challenges. So I'm going to look at the tool that was presented. <laughs> Maybe that's one answer to this, um, to uh, overcome this big challenge we have at the moment to, um, yeah, yeah, be innovative in the ways we, you know, we go outwards. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Clement. I see you are speaking. Pro yes, 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 yes. Probably, okay. yeah, I, I, I would just agree, or I just agreed with, with uh, Professor Hoffman. Uh, I, I don't have a special comments to this uh, to this topic. Probably, I can I can talk about uh, something what was mentioned before, as as the cooperation many times depends on the financial resources that that are available uh, for for. Uh, uh, strengthening of cooperation, as and I, as I already presented, we made a research in Slovakia among the uh, technological clusters and cooperation between enterprises and other institutions, and we found out that the cooperation stopped at the moment when the funds were spent, and they were unable to cooperate anymore. So it's it's very typical for our country that that the the formal structures of cooperation were established just to spend available funds, structural funds from European Union, and, and it finished very, very fast after spending the money. So that's, that is what we are missing here in Slovakia, for example, that we don't have a sustainable support system for, for clusters and for small and medium-sized enterprises, how to cooperate with others something that Mr. Kot already mentioned, what well, is existing in Hungary, uh, some indirect form how the government can uh, support and stimulate the willingness of SMEs to cooperate, for example, by some tax allowances. So if, if they are able to cooperate and they spend the money uh, for cooperation with other enterprises or with academia, they can be rewarded somehow by some tax benefits and so Thank yes uh, and uh, i i also may add something uh, i uh, focus in my research mainly on financing uh, of smes and uh, also of innovative smes and uh, as uh, uh, i think uh, mr cott uh, talked about uh, some gaps uh, in cooperation between academics and uh, businesses and especially SMEs. Uh, I also indicated uh, some possibilities uh, uh, presented by, uh, by small and uh, medium-sized enterprises that, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which reported a lack of capital. And uh, one of possible uh, instruments, let's say, uh, of uh, supporting this kind of cooperation uh, between uh, businesses and especially SMEs and academy, uh, academic institutions is, uh, for example, uh, innovation uh, vouchers, which are, uh, which are uh, offered uh, in Slovakia. I know that also in the Czech Republic. 
uh, but uh, the the question is uh, if it is sufficient support because for example as for the last call in Slovakia which uh, was published in February this year uh, to apply for these innovation vouchers uh, the total the total amount which uh, was allocated to this call uh, for the whole Slovakia is 300,000 euros and one voucher for for one cooperation between a business and academic institution is only maximum 10,000 euros and uh, this is not enough uh, maybe it is uh, an issue for discussion but uh, this is one example of uh, of, of possible solutions. Uh, the question is uh, if it is sufficient and what what uh, should be done in this area in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comments? Uh, I would like to share. Yes, please. Uh, I want to note that in collaboration uh, between uh, different uh, uh, units, uh, industry and academical must be, uh, collaboration must be uh, win uh, each other because uh, it, it give a, in the level of uh, technology, uh, innovation, technology and uh, uh, financial, finance. As well, uh, after we uh, work together uh, we op can obtain effect of synergy. Uh, we must uh, teach from industry, and industry can teach from academy. And in this mean uh, effect, synergy will be uh, higher. Thank you. Thank you. What uh, I was going to say that we are now uh, completing a project funded by the National Fund for Research about determinants of internationalization of small and medium-sized enterprises, which also include the cross-border entrepreneurship, the motivation, the barrier of uh, internationalization, the activity, and what impressed uh, us by the findings is the fact that, as a main reasons to choose a partner country and partner company is the infrastructure, the first, it's without question. The second is the friendly attitude of the partnering country government procedures for international business. And it came at uh, less uh, as importance, factors like, like common language, I mean linguistic language, not professional jargon, and also cultural proximity. And it's surprising that some of our entrepreneurs now are quite well cooperating with Far East countries, like South Korea, Vietnam, China. We start exporting wine to China and yogurt. <laughs> also, like it's a tradition for many years uh, with Japan. But also, uh, we start to look for partners in India, in some African countries. Also, the Bulgarian diaspora helped us, but it's related to countries like uh, United States. Maybe you know the biggest Bulgarian city abroad is Chicago, but after Polish, there are, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there are uh, more than Bulgarians there. Uh, and uh, now, when we are relatively uh, isolated because of uh, interrupted flight connection. I ask, uh, does concern the infrastructure? Would you affect in the long term the opportunities for cooperating internationally? If we cannot meet people, if we cannot sit on one table, if we cannot speak privately, what do you think? In my opinion, it's hard. Uh, I think that our present collaboration still 
last because we've got experience from the past. But yeah, and we've got examples, and we uh, we are going with this accelerator, but it cannot be a long time. Uh, so I think that it will be very hard to find new good relation only via the technological innovative like online conferences and so on. It could be a big problem. And also those relation we've got still can, can be weaker and weaker in the, in the future if we have no opportunity to collaborate personally. Yes. Uh, during the, the uh, dinner, you said probably, or some, some, some other professor, that uh, now uh, we've got less and less agent working in distance. The enterprises ordered agents to go and personally negotiate uh, contracts because it is much more sufficient than online. So it shows the direction that we cannot stand a long time with this situation as, as, as now. I've got one more question to Professor Capellano because he is a specialist in this area and I'm sure he can suggest us very good suggestion for the uh, collaboration development, especially to the universities and to the business. Uh, dear Professor, can you suggest us a few suggestions, what to do to collaborate more efficiently, to start collaboration, how you do this, uh, this, uh, this network uh, you, you started, what to do to collaborate with the business. Uh, I know, okay, it's common language, yeah, it's, it's true, but what else? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, I fear to be like, you, you gave me too much importance, I presume, but uh, I'll try to do my best to give some insights on the stories that I've been collecting to the last years. Uh, just the fact that uh, I was saying, um, uh, basically, uh, you, you are talking about how to change the role of, uh, of universities from simply delivering teaching and research into an entrepreneurial role which is kind of a one action, one of the main actions which uh, at the core of open innovation that European Union is, um, is trying to, you know, to implement throughout Europe. So firstly, a new role of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur university. For instance, my university, which is in Eastern Finland, even though I work remotely from the other side of Europe for COVID. Um, so uh, basically I live in Italy. So while they are up to, to Finland. So basically they work a lot with private or uh, public funds, but uh, like uh, collecting, uh, you know, uh, collecting uh, um, many funds on uh, competitive uh, tenders. Like, you know, some uh, European Union is uh, delivering some tenders for research. And my university is competing a lot on this. It's a well, uh, you know, well-known university, and they are getting much funds on this side. They are still public funds, but based on a competitive uh, selection. Or other industries are uh, other universities have been prompting uh, research and development for their business. So it depends a lot of the level of innovate, of innovativeness of the business in Poland, which I think is quite high, but uh, if they want to outsource the research and development, so it depends also on the management choices, then again, is uh, the switch between uh, close innovation, open innovation. So if they think that you can give them, um, that you can give them a benefit in research and development, definitely they will choose you as a laboratory or research center. For instance, another university I've been working on uh, has been funded by different firms to test their material. This is because they, at university, in the laboratory, they have a special machine which make a particular test that otherwise would cost too much more for companies to buy the machine and do all the process. While they give them the, the you know, the the material and they test it and they can give a seal of uh, guarantee for that. 
So it depends a lot on fine tune the innovation demand and try to give the innovation supply. So basically what knowledge your, your business wants and what kind of uh, instruments they can, they can implement and what can university provide to make the match between demand and supply. I don't know if I answered correctly to your questions, but uh, feel free to, to, to ask me more. Thank you. And uh, I'm watching my watch and I'm seeing that the time to end the session is approaching. Uh, I'd like uh, once again to hear Professor Andrew Spooks, uh, because I cannot see him uh, now on the screen. If he is here and if uh, Professor Puxas wants to sh share some thought on the discussion questions, or anybody else, something as concluding remarks or note. I said uh, the question as complex and is not easy to answer in a definite way right now, but it's a good start for establishing some partnership from that round table to exchange ideas, findings, and to prepare maybe joint proposal if there is crossing uh, points of interest. So, any concluding thought or Professor Kot, please? Apologize, I'm speaking too, too much. Uh, However, uh, final conclusion, I'm very sad and very happy. I'm happy we are going to the lunch together and we can still discuss. And I'm very sad you cannot join us. So, apologize. Uh, it could be nice to, to see you during the lunch time after a few minutes, but uh, we cannot, and this is the problem. Thank you. Thank you. I see Professor Hoffman. Once yeah, I don't know if it's a final, it's a, if it's a conclusion, but something that we really experienced in the last months and the current context and all the challenges we are faced with is that uh, to do something is better than to do nothing. So even if we can meet here online and yeah, we cannot work for lunch together, which is a shame, I agree. <laughs> but it's still good to, to keep doing things and to keep thinking about how can we actually improve and how can we face these new challenges or some of them are old challenges and they still are there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we are just like um, very happy that we can still continue to cooperate and work um, with all the different institutions and uh, exchange on different ideas. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I see the hand of Dr. Capellano. Yes, I want to say that I, I would very like enjoy to be there with you, especially talking about entrepreneur, entrepreneurial universities and how to uh, spread innovation across the, the sectors. And it's, uh, I really thank your organization and all the, the people from academia. Uh, I swear that I will come back as soon as you know the situation will, uh, will, uh, will improve. I, I would be very, very uh, glad to come back and to meet you in person. Okay. Enjoy your lunch on my side as well. Okay. May I have uh, one yes, comment please. also? Uh, the, my comment is that we agreed about everything and uh, it's a pity that we <laughs> have now a different opinion about uh, uh, different solutions. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Maybe because we didn't uh, investigate the problems uh, enough. The doctor's joke that uh, everyone has some disease, but they just need to investigate it better. So, uh, but uh, I would like to wish you all of you to stay safe, healthy, and soon to meet with those we had a chance now to have around the table face to face. Once again, thank you, and see you soon without COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.
Hello, Tomáš. How are you? Yep. Yes. Hello, hello. I can hear well, you, but I don't, I don't, don't, I don't see it. I'm, so I'm Aldomar. One moment. Okay, it, let's let's start. It's not on the screen. Let's start. This is round table number three. This this is la, last round table. So I think that we have the opportunity to discuss the most important thing because we have been listening to some very interesting presentations. And before we start this roundtable, which will concern cross-border cooperation at internal and external EU borders, I would like shortly to introduce myself. Tomasz Studzieniecki, Gdynia Maritime University, it means I come from the Baltic Sea region, working for the first EU macro-regional strategy, which is a Baltic Sea region strategy, and I am very glad that I have panelists from different regions, from different countries that have their own experience. So let me introduce, I will start with my friends who are here, Professor Martin Klatt. Professor Martin Klatt works at the University of Southern Denmark in Denmark, but is very cross-border oriented because lives in Germany and works in Denmark. And Professor Andrzej Jakubowski is from the eastern part of Poland, the city of Lublin. So this is also the cross-border cross area between Poland, Poland and Ukraine, especially Ukraine. And as I know, we have three uh, panelists that are here. Hello, hello, I see. I see, hello. Uh, I see Christina from Ukraine. Yes. Hello, 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 Christina. <laughs> hello, uh, hello. I, I see Aldoma Rickert. Aldoma, I am very glad that you found time because you are the only person that knows the reality outside Europe. Unfortunately, we in, in Europe are a little bit too much European oriented. Even, oh, even well. if I had the opportunity to a little bit correct the name of the table, I would correct think you that we not only have internal borders, external borders, but, but we have borders outside Europe. And That's I am right. very, very That's glad right. that you will have the opportunity to, to present it. Well, I'm, I'm very glad too, and pleased <laughs> to meet you. And, and, and I, I am also very, very glad that, that, that uh, Gabriela found time to, 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 to join us, because it's a little bit different to think about cross-border cooperation in, in, in Western Europe, as, as Martin knows this experience, how it used to be, and we in Eastern Europe, when we a little bit had to learn how, how, to, how, how, how to use, because our tradition is not uh, as, as long as the tradition in Western Europe. Before we start our discussion, I would like to introduce Christina Pretula. Christina Pretula. 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 Christina Pretula. National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Christina, yes. please give yes. the introduction because I know that you, you, you have experience in territorial cooperation, cross-border cooperation. So what is your point of view? How do you, how do you see it? How do you find it? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to... Uh, do you hear me? Because yes, perfectly. Perfectly, okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate all the participants of our panel, of the uh, international conference, and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to participate in your event. Uh, I don't uh, prepare uh, the presentation, I just, uh, I just uh, try uh, to uh, briefly to outline uh, main uh, uh, tendencies, peculiarities of cross-border cooperation development at uh, external and internal uh, borders, and uh, maybe more uh, detailly uh, focused on uh, um, cross-border cooperation uh, development between uh, uh, Ukrainian border regions and uh, EU member states regions. Um, uh, because uh, the develop, uh, we can um, see some uh, parallel uh, and uh, between uh, the development of cross-border cooperation in EU and in uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
um, cross-border cooperation uh, started uh, on late uh, 1950s um, with two main institutional uh, acting act actors, it's the European Commission and uh, Council of Europe. Um, for a long time, cross-border cooperation uh, was cons uh, considered as additional instrument of uh, European integration process and uh, uh, the central uh, actors were national states. For a long time, uh, European integration process um, uh, focused uh, mainly at uh, strengthening economic and social cohesion, uh, not uh, territorial uh, integration. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty and uh, new European strategy Europe 2020 introduced um, a new set dimension is territorial uh, cohesion. And in 1990, Interact was developed as a new community uh, initiative uh, covering mainly uh, cross-border cooperation and later uh, uh, Interact uh, has been extended to transnational and um, inter-regional cooperation. Uh, two regulations uh, they were um, of uh, European Parliament and of the Council, and uh, they were very important uh, for development uh, cross-border cooperation at external borders, uh, were adopted in uh, uh, 2006 and 2014. Uh, this um, regulation established a new instrument. It, uh, um, uh, partnership, uh, a neighborhood and partnership instrument, and later from 2014 year, it uh, became a European um, a neighborhood instrument, uh, which um, um, enabled to uh, activate, stimulate uh, the cross-border cooperation at external borders of EU uh, member states. Uh, Ukraine uh, cross-border cooperation development started uh, after uh, 1991, after collapse of Soviet Union, uh, and only in 1993, uh, Supreme Council of Ukraine uh, adopted, uh, the, uh, ratified uh, the Madrid Convention, and during the years uh, 2004, 20. Uh, 13, uh, Supreme Council ratified uh, three protocols of this convention. Uh, on the national level uh, of Ukraine, we have um, a law about cross-border cooperation adopted in uh, 2004 uh, and in, uh, 19, uh, in 2018, as uh, the law uh, was amended um, in part of structures responsible for uh, cross-border cooperation because in the first um, uh, law uh, only yellow, region, or, or, uh, yellow regions were the only structures, only forms, form of cross-border cooperation we uh, could develop. And after uh, these amendments uh, in our um, uh, law, uh, as uh, our law was uh, um, the list of the structures uh, were extended to EGTCs, uh, European Grouping of Territorial um, uh, Cooperation and uh, ECGs, European uh, Regional Cooperation Grouping. Uh, from uh, 2011, um, on national level, we also developing uh, state programs uh, for cross-border cooperation. And this year, uh, in July, uh, we adopted a new a state program for cross-border cooperation for the period 2021-2027. Uh, 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 financial support of this uh, program um, is provided from different, different funds, uh, state and local budgets. Uh, we have a state fund for regional development, but uh, main financial instruments uh, for the development of cross-border cooperation with the participation of Ukrainian border regions uh, are still European instruments. And for this uh, new program, uh, about uh, 30 million euros 
uh, were provided to implement this program for the next programming period. Uh, your regions uh, remain, as for me, uh, important uh, structures in the system of cross-border cooperation development. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, cross-border cooperation uh, within Euro regions started from uh, 1993, and the first Euro regions uh, were created uh, together with uh, Polish uh, border regions. Uh, it, it were Capacian Euro region and Buk Euro region. Uh, today, we have 10 Euro regions uh, across the entire uh, state Ukrainian uh, border. Um, so we can divide these regions into two groups. The first one uh, together, created uh, together with EU uh, member states and uh, another one uh, created with uh, non-EU uh, member states. Um, EU regions uh, created with EU member states, of course, uh, there are activities, uh, more activities and they are developing more actively. Uh, after activities of the four EU regions, uh, which were created on the eastern border of Ukraine, uh, were suspended um, uh, since uh, 2013 after Russian military, uh, military aggression, and what, which uh, makes it impossible to develop cross-border cooperation between Ukraine and this country. Uh, uh, development of cross-border cooperation and uh, deepening uh, interactions within uh, different EU regional uh, structures uh, um, um, uh, result, resulted in uh, imagine uh, new forms of cross-border cooperation. And in EU, uh, such uh, cross-border EU regional structures uh, as working uh, communities, uh, European grouping of territorial cooperation, European regional co uh, cooperation groupings, uh, Euro districts, Euro cities, uh, now um, are developing very uh, effectively. Uh, and uh, they are also uh, so active as uh, Euro regions. Uh, the first uh, EGTCs uh, appeared in EU in uh, 2006, and for now uh, about uh, 70 uh, such uh, structures are created um, uh, at uh, internal and external EU borders. In Ukraine, only uh, in the year 2015, uh, we created uh, the first um, uh, the one uh, EGTCs for now uh, between uh, the Karpatska uh, Oblast and Hungarian border uh, region. Uh, uh, summarizing, uh, um, uh, if we talk about the similarities and differences uh, of cross-border cooperation development uh, at external and internal um, borders. Uh, of course, um, uh, due to bigger history, due to a stronger legal and institutional base for development of cross-border cooperation, uh, due to stronger powers and uh, uh, more variety of instruments, uh, financial resources, uh, cross-border cooperation uh, is uh, uh, develops uh, more actively and more uh, deep uh, at uh, internal uh, borders of uh, EU member uh, EU member states. Um, uh, the structures, the regional structures, are more active. Uh, in, uh, the uh, homogeneous legal and institutional field. Uh, also uh, uh, play a important role in this process. Uh, the role of um, uh, borders in Europe, uh, the, the borders um, have evolved from barriers to uh, bridges, to possibilities, uh, to uh, more resources. Uh, in the case of uh, external uh, borders, uh, there are still uh, many uh, obstacles uh, which uh, 
uh, associated with uh, uh, low level of uh, border infrastructure development uh, with uh, insufficient uh, quantity of uh, checkpoint um, uh, with uh, um, inconsistency of spatial development of cross-border regions. Uh, so the... Uh, so you, you seem to be an optimist. <laughs> no, no, I am optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And, yes, okay, yes. Uh, but um, uh, European integration is a key priority of Ukrainian development and uh, cross-border uh, cooperation uh, is an uh, important part of this process. Uh -huh. Maybe briefly. <laughs> Thank that, you. that was a nice introduction. I, I don't want to interrupt, just opposite. It will be very in interesting to hear the opinion of a person outside European Union, because we are inside, so we can be not as objective as you are. So, so later I would like to uh, give a chart to, to, to you and to listen your opinion, especially about, about the, the new proposals of new instruments but now we have to concentrate on, on the birthday. Do you know that this year we celebrate birth, birthday? <laughs> birthday, birthday of Interact? Yes, perfect, <laughs> birthday of Interact. Birthday of Interact. And, and, and I think that, that, the, that, that uh, uh, the proper person to tell us ab ab about evolution, about successes and unsolved problem will be Martin Klad, because I think that, that, that this cross-border cooperation started in Western Europe. You, re re you remember first what was in Germany, between Ger Germany and Netherlands. So Martin, what is your, your opinion? Has thank, it been successful? Thank you, Thomas. Has been a success. Uh, it's this half empty, half full thing. Uh, yes and no. Uh, of course, it has been a success because it is a uh, part uh, where the EU realized that this regional cross-border cooperation, what they call territorial cooperation today, is an important part of European integration. We had this yesterday in the um, in the uh, keynote from of Eduardo Damerus. Damerus is this uh, from cooperation to integration. I mean, we talk about European integration, and Interreg is an instrument that has been designed to foster cooperation that will lead to integration. Uh, on the other side, uh, and uh, I would also be careful when, when Thomas, when you introduce and say well, we can learn a lot from Western Europe because you are much more advanced and you have been with this so much longer. Um, when we look in detail, I think, on cross-border territories, on cross-border regions, um, we can perhaps see that there are more examples of projects that went well when we look in Western Europe because of the longer history or the networks have been older. But we can, when we look at the structural issues, which all these instruments are supposed to help us with, uh, I would say they are all the same. It's the administrative barriers we have, which make it difficult to, um, to um, get into a real cross-border commitment. And the EGTC, I mean, we have a lot of EGTCs, but in my opinion, very few of them actually commit themselves to something. That they really commit themselves, we will now integrate our cross-border sewage system. We will integrate our rescue services. We will integrate schooling. We will integrate public transportation systems. This is it's usually a lot of letters of intent what we try to do and cooperate, but very few commitments of actually sharing resources, which is what, especially when you look at peripheral border regions, and now we can come into the external borders of the EU, which, uh, which uh, per se are somehow peripheral. I don't think we have uh, any, well, if you take Switzerland, of course, we have a metropolitan cross-border region, but if we talk like the, what we understand of external borders of the EU are usually rather remote places. Um, uh, which uh, have become even remoter because of the specific border situation. So Interreg, uh, and, and the other development we have in Interreg is we started with a lot of very small programs, really in border regions, and there has been this tendency to centralization of Interreg. So now it's usually one, we have a, one program for Germany and the Netherlands, we have one program for Germany and Denmark, uh, we have... Uh, uh, 
one program but, for but every border. I'm sorry, but, hmm? but bet between Germany and Poland, there are so many programs. You still have different, okay. Yes, we have like, uh, Andrzej, how many? Four, three or four? I think that's three. Three. three okay. Three. Then you must have been you must have been very persistent then that you managed <laughs> yeah. to overcome the pressure because the commission was my impression DJ Rijo, they wanted to centralize it and then of course the other issue of out interact is this uh, harmonizing so it's like to it's it's like a catch it all it's like one theme and when I look at the operational programs I made a comparison of one. From at that time, external, now internal border region, uh, Hungary, Croatia, where we had a project in 2004 5, which was also about cooperation, culture, and so on. And uh, we had did some interesting field studies there, um, found that there was a lot of potential, especially we had this lecture about integrating minorities into cooperation, which they did very well there. Um, but uh, on the other hand, when I look at the present operational program, Hungary, Croatia, it seems to be like this could be everywhere. I have difficulties finding uh, a really look at the regions and local potentials where we could actually cooperate. But it's this general phrase is we will have like environment and environmental tourism and uh, bike routes and things like this. But it's not, uh, and it's very much EU speak. And it seems to be designed in, in, in Budapest and, and Zagreb, and not, on the, not on the region. So I would see um, the, the, uh, the important thing is that, that, the, that the local actors on the border be, are integrated more and, and also become much more proactive in finding out what do we actually want to do, what can we do together. Marty, I'm, I'm very glad because actually you started an, an interesting SWOT analysis but we don't have to have, have time to complete this analysis. And I would like, I would like at first, intro, in, introduce uh, 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 Yulia. Hello, 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 Yulia. Where are you? Hello, I'm here. You, we can hear you, but we cannot, we cannot see you. Okay, but, wait, but, wait a minute. Okay. Hello. Hello, hello. Now we can see. We are very glad that, that you yes. join us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being late. Uh, no I'm problem. I know. Noon. I know you have different times, so 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 we understand no, it. Uh, <laughs> no, the same okay. time with Poland. We have the same time with Poland, but today I'm um, at home with my kids. Okay. So I I <laughs> I cannot be constantly online. So I'm here from Kaliningrad. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this conference. I'm very proud to be among mm, such uh, brilliant scientists. And thank you, um, Professor Joanna Kurovskopish and Professor Tomasz Tudzinski for this uh, conference. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, later, we will talk about old instruments of cross-border cooperation and new instruments, and I will be very interested to hear your opinion. But uh, and after, after uh, our short discussion and, and after this, what Martin said, uh, I, I may have the impression that maybe we in Eastern Europe, maybe we, 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 we are not so long in, in European Union, may, maybe we have a little more enthusiasm <laughs> about cross-border cooperation because we, we, we can win, win, we can win more. That's, that's why, that, that's why for, for example, in Poland we, we have 16 Euro, Euro regions, and not, mm -hmm. not only Euro regions, we have created kind of federation, of a Polish federation of Euro regions, because we still believe that, that this, this instrument can help to, to, to solve different problems. So, so um, but I would like now to, 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 to ask uh, Gabriela. Gab Gabriela, what, what do you think about cross-border cooperation, successes and, 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 and fails? What's your opinion? Hello, Hello Tomasz. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you uh, after four years. I think that we met in a conference in Ihlava, in yes. Czech Republic. Yes, nice to, uh, nice to see uh, you again. Yeah. Uh, coordinator, 
uh, from University College of Business in Prague, Czech Republic. So we have many, many cooperation with uh, uh, European countries and also non-European countries. Um, sincerely, I, um, I thought about this challenge to be a part of um, international territorial and inter-organizational cooperation uh, conference uh, in Brenna. And uh, uh, it was for me uh, uh, a high challenge to talk about um, uh, this uh, kind of uh, stress, what we, uh, what we are reflecting with uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown and economy and mm -hmm. uh, uh, a strong um, impact of a lot of uh, development projects uh, in the European cooperation and uh, European territorial cooperation, as mentioned by Professor Martin Klatt. Um, so we may talk about the success of European territorial cooperation as well and about impacts of the development policy in the European cooperation as results of many development projects. Um, even more, which were aiming on culture heritage, on cleaning up our oceans as uh, 30th anniversary of Interreg, uh, aimed on uh, those kind of cooperation and uh, a lot of, uh, many of projects uh, resulted of many development uh, tasks. Uh, obviously, we may talk about the strengthening cooperation of European Union and uh, Visegrad Group with mm -hmm. potential new members as uh, Western Balkan countries or European partnership, as uh, uh, Christina uh, mm -hmm. mentioned here before. Uh, although to, we are facing a big challenge uh, to know uh, the coronavirus lockdown crisis. So I would like to share with you uh, a one graph, if it would be possible, uh, if we have a bit of time, about two or three minutes. Yes, uh, yes, yes go ahead. For you, uh -huh. because um, uh, I think uh, that is a good uh, challenge to talk about. Uh, we have here um, a lot of increasing cases all around the world and uh, also uh, fiscal um, balances of all economies of the world. And uh, my, uh, my challenge about to talk is that my contemplation is about the spiritual crisis, not about economic crisis, uh, neither, uh, neither social crisis. It's more about uh, uh, a challenge to be a tolerant and uh, more virtual cooperation as well, uh, and strengthening uh, new challenges to work uh, all together and develop more projects uh, to uh, uh, for for uh, developing uh, a system as a as a European policy cohesion fund for uh, for helping um, healthcare system and uh, strengthen the, the new cross-border cooperation after the coronavirus crisis, because we have to uh, think together now, uh, be, be a part of uh, research and development activities as an innovation to, to discover a new vaccine, because we have to stop this coronavirus crisis as well, uh, for, for uh, the next future to, to work uh, face-to-face uh, -face with our colleagues, European colleagues, non-European colleagues, Western Balkan co uh, countries colleagues. Uh, so it seems that coronavirus could give for the strong external cooperation in the exchange of students, mm -hmm. Erasmus Plus, uh, or research cross-border projects, uh, for, uh, which are focusing on the regional development as well and uh, maintenance of cultural heritage. Um, yeah, humanity as a whole has faced an unprecedented biological treat. And uh, as you know, in TEDx, uh, in 2004, one professor talked about this crisis. So uh, it, it, was, it was Ebola crisis, but it wasn't 
uh, it it uh, hadn't got a big uh, uh, spreading as a coronavirus now. So we are in the new challenge, and uh, um, also also European Policy Fund and uh, new calls for uh, European uh, projects are reflecting this crisis and uh, uh, they would like to they would like to help uh, countries uh, for uh, for this kind of uh, for this kind of uh, cooperation so uh, all calls of the european projects as well are responding investment initiative uh, for uh, against the coronavirus crisis mm -hmm. and uh, i hope that uh, if we are going hands uh, by hands, uh, all together, that uh, we will face a good impact of this kind of cooperation. Uh, so, Gabriela, uh, Gab Gabriela, I I have to say that you raised a very very important issue. We are talking about this yesterday, and frankly speaking, when we have seen these recession curves. Maybe our optimism a little bit decreased, but I'm sure that our realism increased, and I perfectly agree that it is so important issue that, that the cross-border cooperation may, may, may change in a very, 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 very huge way. But before we come back to, to our U European future, we European problems, I think that it would be so interesting to listen to Aldomar's point of view, because I, oh. I am very in interested, Aldomar, if, if our experience is kind of inspiration for, for, for different continents, or you have your own solutions. What's your opinion? <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Thomas. Uh, it's a real big, big pleasure to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, here in Brazil, so it's morning. I have uh, I have had breakfast uh, just a few minutes okay. ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a real big pleasure. It's uh, I've been to Poland last year, so uh, I've been to the Czech and Silesia region. So it's Perfect. one of my research uh -huh. objects. So uh, uh -huh. I I've been doing research in South America in the European Union. Uh, since 2010, 2011. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, I uh, prepared some uh, slides and I was not sure if I could present them. Uh, it's just a few slides because I'm a geographer and I, have, mm -hmm. I need to show uh, some realities that are quite different uh, than uh, your context of border cooperation. And uh, uh, besides, uh, Brazil is a very uh, huge, big country, it's so we, our border strip is enormous, so it's a quite different experience. So if you don't mind, could I, if you allow me to show, me, show some... Please slides. go it's ahead, possible. just opposite, we are very interested, so please do it. Okay, so yeah. let's try to share my screen, so let's go ahead. O okay, guys, can Let, you... Let's can try, you if, it, if I... Yeah, yeah. I'm, successful here Wait, low let's see can you can you, can you do yes, it just a minute not yet okay not you yet. you can do it okay so let um, okay oh i lost uh, i have to see my slide okay so i guess not well let's see oh here person okay share okay okay now we see it okay, okay. so uh -huh. uh, well, so my, my name is Richard. So I work at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in South Brazil. So I'm a full professor in the geography department and I work mostly with master and doctoral programs. I'm also a, a CNPK researcher. That means the National, National Council of, for Science and Technology. Well, my my project is uh, on about territorial policies in changing scenarios and uh, cross-border processes and cross-border regions in European Union and South America. So I have some support from government funds 
And so I have been doing research in exactly in these cross-border regions and here in South America with Paraguay, with Argentina, Uruguay. And uh, well, uh, and I have to say that I began in 2011 to work uh, on, on, on the Rhine Trinational Metropolitan Region. Uh, a student of mine uh, made some research and we published about the great region. And last year I was in Silesia, so this is a great pleasure to uh, pick it up again. Let's see and say that I am trying to study your region. So <laughs> that's kind of, uh, uh, kind of difficult, but we have to go ahead. So uh, here I am, uh, this in South America. So um, I'm kind of 10,000 kilometers far away. This is my university, UFFGS, and this is my city. Porto Alegre, happy port that it means. It's a Portuguese city from the 1700s, uh, 1500, uh, 18th century. Well, this is uh, our cross our border. It, uh, it's 15,719 kilometers, kilometers of land border. So uh, this, this strip is uh, for the security. It's, uh, it's called the security and defense board, uh, strip border. This is kind of old, you know, very ancient from the 19th century. And uh, this is a real big problem for cooperation, let's say. So uh, my initial question, so even for us, uh, what does it mean uh, to research uh, border problems in Brazil or related to its 10 country neighbors, included France, French Guiana? So we, uh, we're, we're neighbors of French, you know, uh, France, I mean. So this is quite difficult and complicated. So there is here an initial solution of dividing the border uh, regions in three, north, central, and south. You can see that south is the smallest one. And here, the, the, just on, at, on the bottom, this is my state, Rio Grande do Sul, the RS. So we are neighboring with Uruguay and Argentina, and the other states are neighboring with Paraguay. And Amazon is the real big, uh, big arc, you know, but it does not mean that this is forest, you know, so, so this, the south is the most urbanized region and concentrated demographically and industrialized region. So uh, to, to work with regional development policies on cross-border regions in Mercosur, so our common market, South America, so my focus and my theoretical concepts is the bordering, the bordering, the rebordering. Well, so this is a process, a constant process. And so I could say we uh, really have trans-border processes, but we don't have cross-border regions. So this is an initial answer to my question. Uh, cross-border regions in Mercosul, do they exist? I would say no, formally they do not exist. Besides, we have to deal nowadays with a pessimistic scenario with anti-integration processes. You know, uh, we, uh, South America, since 2010, uh, had some very progressive years of integration. We call them the golden years, and now the golden years are, are gone. You know, so uh, we have some political complicated situations nowadays. nowadays. So, to uh, give you some more details, to say how complicated it is to understand cross-border in cooperations in South America with Mercosul and 10 countries in Brazil. We have Brazil, only Brazil has 33 twin cities on this border, this strip border, okay? So this is the defense border. And the, here in the south, this map just in the center of my slide. This is what we call the Rio de la Prata Basin. It means a silver river basin. It's an ancient old times from the old colonial uh, exploitation of silver and gold in the Andes. So this, these were the main ports to, to Europe. Well, here, this map, you can see at least 22 Brazilian twin cities. 22, only Brazilian, I'm not counting the other ones. 
And for us in South uh, Rio Grande do Sul state, we are neighboring, as I said, with mm -hmm. Uruguay and Argentina. We have 11, 11 twin cities. So it is the state with the highest number of twin cities. I'll show you this, this picture and you will see just a, a, a small monument. This small monument means that from the uh, left side, you are in Argentina and on the right side, you're in Brazil. So you, you see, we have very close proximities in some twin cities. You know, it's very colorful, and, but it is a quite conurbated city, uh, region. It's three cities, one are Bernardo de Rigo in Argentina, Tunisia Cerqueira in Barracão, aside Brazil, in two different states. It's complicated anyway. Uh -huh. To complicate a little bit the th things, uh, this is a, a photo taken last week from one of my, uh, our researchers, Camilo Carneiro, his name is on the, the foot. You see the Argentinian army on the border with Brazil. So on the left, you have Brazil. On the right side, Argentina. And now we have the army. So how can we talk about cooperation because of the COVID situation? Uh, Argentina has been quite, quite uh, strong against uh, these exchanges of people. Of course, uh, borders are closed. So anyway, let's be not so pessimistic. I, I could say that uh, since 2004, 2005, border region analysis and public policies for cooperation have developed strongly. 2005, these first studies, borders of Brazil, security, public security on borders, socioeconomical conditions, demography, health, pub, public health, and so on. This one is the, one of the best experiences we have with Uruguay. You can see two strips, one uh, each side of each country. This was our first great step into real inter territorial integration because these are citizens that uh, habitants of Uruguay and inhabitants of Rio Grande do Sul state. That means these uh, habitants got the right to live and work in both sides. This was our real uh, first step and we can say this, uh, we are proud of it, that we have a real good uh, territorial, social uh, uh, in-laws also, and uh, family relations with Uruguay. So, uh, I was saying that these analyses have grown, of course, and here I have to say that we have also uh, made developments since 2003 for a national policy for regional development. So, since 2003, uh, 12 uh, until today. So this, uh, these, this regional borders takes a good look at the border, at these uh, border uh, arts, and we have also this uh, uh, different typologies. Just to explain a little bit more, each state, we have uh, 10 states on the border, has his own plan of development, of integration. So these are the these uh, these state border centers. No, sorry, it's eleven states on the border. So this is a, in Portuguese nucleus estaduais de fronteira border state borders. So these borders are supposed to develop uh, proximities mainly with mayors uh, and uh, groups of mayors in different regions in these these almost 15,000 kilometers border. And here is another example, good example, between Argentina and Brazil, you can see this ferry boat. Well, this is the real situation until now, but this is just, this is a big effort to build bridges, to build a third bridge with Argentina and many actors, many organizations, many businessmen, many social actors, local actors, and so on. Many scales and good projects, I would say. And fortunately, we have, been, we have also uh, still uh, uh, South American integration processes of inter, for infrastructures, that, that's, that means EIRSA. Well, this is a good project, well, but it's not uh, until this day, it has not developed. 
here is uh, some other 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 examples of integrated actions that generate development consortium intermunicipal municipalities of the border region with Argentina. So there are many good examples anyway. And here is our, I would say, our golden, golden, uh, golden point. This is supposed to be our first trinational cross-border region between Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. It's about one million people. You can see these three cities here, Ciudad del Este, Paraguay, Paraná River, and Foz do, uh, uh, Foz do Iguaçu, uh, this big, biggest city, Brazilian city, and Puerto Iguaçu, Argentina. This is a conurbated region. I have a small map here, and I have to say, this is not an official uh, three-border, cross-border region, but we are daring to say that this is the first one in South America. So what projects of cooperation are going on uh, in this region? Global tourism, environment, national parks, our colleagues have already made mention to these, these uh, uh, questions, very important. We have uh, subnational actors, cooperation between mayors, integrated board health system. Brazil has a very decentralized health system sees borders for uh, the inhabitants of the uh, of this our neighbor countries and we have also some cooperation one with innovac to european unions with select select means community of latin america and the caribbean countries so these are new projects cooperation on cross-border activities and here you can see a very positive demonstration of fraternity between brazilians Paraguayans and Argentines in Foz do Iguaçu, it says, I will read it first in Spanish, Nacimos de muchas madres, pero aquí solo hay hermanos. We were born from many mothers, but here there are only brothers. It's a very nice uh, sentence, I, I, very, 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 very nice. Here you can see uh, this uh, Iguaçu Falls is the third uh, attraction in Brazil, third biggest attraction. It's an international tourism pole global for glo with global flows. It's located exactly in the border with the, of the three countries. It's one of the seven present, uh, uh, present wonders of the world since 9, 2000, 2010. And uh, if you would ask me, well, how about the budgets, the funds? I can say that the, our political, our, our regional policy is not quite developed yet, but this is the most uh, important example of integration projects and cooperation in trans-border regions for SEM. That means Fund for a Structural Convergence of Mercosul since 2004. It has a federative financial support and the budget for 2020 this year is three, uh, 332 million dollars. It's uh, mainly for uh, uh, human rights, energy, education, roads, railways, institutions, healthcare, and, and so on. And this is our, uh, the, uh, we call it the friendship uh, bridge Brazil Paraguay or friendship Brazil Paraguay bridge. This is the uh, the day, daily situation before COVID. Okay, so 40,000 vehicles a day in both directions. This is Ciudad del Este Paraguay because this is a free uh, duty free zone. So uh, all Asian uh, technology. Uh, merchandises are sold for um, free with uh, duty free for Brazilians. This is the, our biggest uh, bridge, and a new one is being uh, being constructed with Paraguay again. So you can see this photo. This these funds come from the national uh, national budgets, and there is also a very uh, very nice spot aside this bridge. It's a uh, it's a part of integration. And the one another thing that I, I don't have the picture, I didn't, it's not, it's too many. It's Itaipu Binational Dam is the great support, the financial support 
for this uh, bridge, international bridge. And turning to, to the friendship bridge, this is the situation. You can see soldiers. So no more 40,000 vehicles each day, just soldiers and people begging please to go home to Paraguay because all they are all afraid. And now this is the discard bridge. Here you can see wires over the border of Brazil, Paraguay in September last week this was. So this is the street that divides two cities. Uh, on the left, Ponta Porã, Brazilian city. On the right, Pedro Juan Caballero, Paraguayan city. And you have, this is stop, this is wire, don't cross. So the situation is quite dangerous and very tensions. So you can see the workers in Ciudad del Este, protests in Ciudad del Este, Paraguay, we want to work. They defend, uh, they want to go open their commerce because there are, uh, this is the second huge uh, metropolitan region in Paraguay and they need to sell to Brazilians. Well, let's say, uh, for to finalize, let's show you a, a very nice experience of uh, micropolitics of cross-border cooperation. This is a micro region. Uh, it's rural. It's between uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. It's three border too. So you have uh, these sayings, frontera, Uruguay, Brazil. This is border, Brazil, Uruguay. This is very, very interesting. You have a bridge and they have very, very uh, intensive activities. But who? Environmental NOGs uh, that are pushing ahead an integration. And just to call attention, in the middle of this river, there is an island. It's called Brazilian Island. This is a conflict between the three countries since the 19th century. And it is demanded by Uruguay to be Uruguayan island, so Brazil has taken, the, the, taken it from Uruguay. Do you know what the good thing is? The people, don't, they, don't, they don't care about it. They are just uh, cooperating and they have just got the status of uh, a new three-border uh, international committee of for cooperation. And they, we have researches on the, in this region and publication, and I love it very much. So just to tell you, a good thing. So this is a breaking news. Government of Paraguay announced the reopening of the international friendship uh, bridge for next week. So finally, I would uh, close my, my speech uh, thinking about some complicated uh, issues, rebordering in global expansion nowadays because of this crisis and new scales of global, regional, local uncertainties, nationalism, xenophobia, and European Union and South America. Is there an anti-integration processes mm -hmm. over the borders? Well, thank you very much. I beg your pardon because I really took your time and I will uh, stop share. I took too long of your time, but I was really happy to exchange some information with you. No, just just opposite. You 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 create now the necessity to 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 have to have your 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 knowledge, your publications, because we have very limited knowledge about cross border cooperation outside Europe. So no. so, so so we we trust we'll have the opportunity to see your publications because it will be very interesting. And I also, are, I, 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 I am also very thankful that you gave the examples of cross-border cooperation, not only bilateral, but multilateral. I have never been to Brazil, but, but when, you were, when, when, you, when you were talking, I thought I, I, thought I would like to see Tres Fronteras <laughs> and other <laughs> cross-border destinations, because you remember when you were in Szczecin, have you seen this famous three point between yeah, Poland? Sorry. I, I, we, I guess I didn't understand. We we have we have three point between Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, as you showed. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, I've so, been there. I've, so we, I, uh, I, our our good friend, uh, the coordinator, she took me to uh, to our ride in the two day ride in field work. Uh, our good friend, the coordinator of the of the colloque. Uh huh. 
So, uh, yes, I've been there. So I've, uh, I have to say that I've been reading about this region, your Silesia region, for six uh -huh. months already because it's quite difficult uh -huh. for a Brazilian to understand this, uh -huh. this excellent, uh, uh, phenomenal region, Silesia, chess in Silesia region. Yes, I I exactly. I agree. We, we in Europe have been using the tool cost called Euro region. Of course, you, you have heard because uh, uh, Czech yes. and Silesia is also your region. And, and, and uh, at this moment, I would like to, to, to ask, I would, li li I would like to ask uh, Dr. Andrzej Jakubowski from Lublin, because I know that you, you have the knowledge, not only, uh, not only about uh, uh, Euro regions, but also yeah. about yeah. new new forms, new new instruments of cooperation. So my first question is: What is your opinion of your Euro region? We have so many Euro, Euro regions. Do you think uh, it's it's effective, or do you think that we have to look for new instruments? Okay. Now it should be okay. Thank you. Tomasz, thank you very much for the question. And uh, Professor Rucker, thank you very much for a very different perspective from another continent. Uh, but we'll come back to the Europe and the Euro regions. Uh, uh, the first Euro region was created, established uh, over 60 years ago. So uh, I think this is a good time to assess uh, the effectiveness of Euro regions. Yeah, you were very young in that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, you know. Uh, the Euro regions flourished and they were um, established in Europe in a few waves uh, in the 80s and in 90s in Central and European Union and I I don't understand I don't remember this time because I was uh, a child in a, uh, in a primary school but now investigating Euro regions I read a lot of papers from the 90s uh, written by Polish scientists and I may feel this enthusiasm towards Euro regions uh, there were so many papers about the visions of cross border cooperation about Euro regions as a platforms of cross border cooperation and uh, uh, Yes, we may now ask to what extent this, uh, this our enthusiasm and expectations were, um, uh, were fulfilled. So um, there's no single answer for the effectiveness of your regions because there is no single formula for your region and they differ from context to context, from a place to place. And uh, even when we will look to the definition of your region, which is in a, a handbook of uh, association of European border regions, there are uh, like a three or four even types, uh, like a um, uh, association of self-governmental units, as a some transborder association. They may be based on a private law on a public law. So there's no single legal framework. There's no single way uh, dealing with the aims of your regions. So they have a very different aims. We've got some very compact your regions and very extend, like uh, uh, in special terms. Uh, so. Uh, they differ much. And I think that this is the advantage of your regions because uh, we may place your regions in a different arrangements, in a different spaces, different places in Western Europe, in a, this core um, of the Europe and uh, on the external border of the European Union and even outside of the European Union because your regions fit to these different circumstances, different conditions and, and different uh, arrangements but now we may think about some criticism towards your region which yeah, is yeah, uh, yeah, exactly and we may yes ask ourselves I, what I, I, I mean, Andre, constructive criticism constructive, yeah, criticism. constructive criticism i will try yes, um, firstly uh, there is a uh, I, 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 may, uh, I read recently a paper published by uh, Dr. Hovanitz, who is a participant of this conference, and she wrote a paper about uh, regions and regional local development. And she was investigating whether cooperation uh, within the regions uh, has an impact uh, on uh, regional local development. And she, was, um, uh, she made some field studies, field uh, survey, and the people Almost everybody said that your regions, yes, there is an impact on the local regional development. And then people were asked, please tell or uh, show any example of project that was held on the EU region. And nobody was able to, to just uh, talk about any project, so they didn't know about it. Um, more. Um, Professor Medeiros, who was a keynote speaker yesterday, wrote just a 
eight or nine years ago, the paper in a European planning studies about new concept of your region. And he wrote something about your regions that, was, that are located on the external border of the European Union and outside the European Union, that if you've got a really a border that is not permeable, that border that's a hard barrier, we cannot talk about your region because there's no possibility to create this social link, social ties, to the extent that we need to talk about the Euro region. And we may also think about what your region is. We've got a region in the name. And from the geographical standpoint, the human geography, region is not only area that is delineated at, according to some criteria, but we, there is some uh, uh, ideational dimension. The people should feel some sense of belonging to the region, uh, uh, should feel the ties with the people living outside of the border, and should uh, uh, shouldn't uh, feel that they are that uh, they are living in your region. And in how many cases in Europe, people uh, identify themselves with the Euro region? I think that they identify with the border region, not with the Euro region. Maybe there are some cases. Maybe a grand uh, a grand region is an example. Maybe Tyrol is an example, like, like southern and northern Tyrol. But in many cases, people do not identify themselves with the Euro region. And um, there's also no single legal personality which, is, uh, which hampers uh, cross-border cooperation. And that is why you ask also about new forms of cooperation. I think that the EGTCs are the most important instrument for the cooperation. I think that European Commission answered for this, uh, um, for this uh, the problems con uh, concerning uh, cross-border cooperation within the Euro regions, proposing EGTs as a, a, as a, a institution with a single um, legal personality. And now we've got approximately 80 Euro regions around Europe, uh, beginning from the 50s, and 60 um, EGTCs, which developed 95... 19, every, uh, every month there is uh, one more EGTC. Yes, it's like, <laughs> it's like that. We've got uh, 59 registers, I guess, and uh, three or more in Statun Ascendi. So Euro regions were developing through 60 years. EGTCs are developing through uh, 14 years at this moment. Yeah, 2006. Yes, so it shows that there was a need uh, it proves that there was a need to, to create such an institutional form of uh, cooperation. And I think that is, it, it may be quite successful, but uh, still, I think it's too early to assess comprehensively EGTCs. I, li I, I like your diplomatic uh, word, quite successful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. But we are um, in front of the new perspective for European Union. And uh, there we may observe some shift towards the functional approach to the cross-border cooperation. And there is a, a suggestion to create some kind of a cross-border functional areas. So integrate and cooperate based on the functional ties. And I think this is a good way. Um, this is uh, something that follows uh, the new approach that we observe uh, for the internal cohesion policy uh, in the previous perspective that the functional ties were supported uh, by the European Union, European Commission. And uh, I think this is a good way uh, because uh, it's, uh, uh, it follows the way that uh, Andreas Faludi thinks about uh, cross-border cooperation, about territoriality, about the planning uh, uh, of development. We, in fact, have a uh, different spaces, overlapping spaces of actors that are cooperating with each other. Uh, these ties, these interrelations, these linkages are not always, they not always fit uh, into the Eurasian borders, EGTC's borders. So we've got some very uh, fuzzy structure of fuzzy partners, fuzzy boundaries of partners, actors that cooperating in a different constellations. These constellations are overlapping and we have to strengthen uh, these this functional ties. And as the Sosa said and proposed in his studies, functional ties are a precondition to the institutional ties and integration. We in Europe started from the institutional ties and then we are developing functional ties. So we are doing quite opposite that it should be in fact. Thank you very much.
Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I like your, your point of view, and I would like to say that it's very interesting. Uh, uh, what, this what what uh, Chris, Christina mentioned about this uh, attempt to create, not, 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 not attempt, this success. And another, and I know that you are involved in preparing cross-border functional area between Poland and Lithuania. So I think it will be the sec second experiment to, to see how it, how it really works. But w talking about Euro regions, I know that there are several Euro regions located on the the, at the borders of Kaliningrad region. And, and, and uh, Julia, what do you think, how effective are Euro regions as far as Kaliningrad region is concerned? Hello, can you hear me? We can hardly hear you. Okay, wait. Now, now, now better, better. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm not actually an expert in Euro regions, but I can say that um, it, it is um, very difficult to analyze the cooperation within Euro regions be because we have several and um, most of them are developing badly mm -hmm. and their cooperation is not developed. Actually, um, the most active is the Euro region Baltic, but as we said um, already, um, it is difficult to analyze this ties, their projects, and the, there is a lack of information about Euro region. And our scientists in the university are trying every time to analyze, to make researches on this, and we have uh, very little information. But as for um, cooperation mm -hmm. in the Kaliningrad region, it, um, we have a unique case because we are talking about the cooperation between the European Union and Russia. Mm -hmm. And we are talking here about the cooperation on the external borders of the European Union. And here we have um, two borders. We borders border on Lithuania and we border on Poland. And here we have two cross-border cooperation programs. Lithuania, Russia and Poland, Russia cross-border cooperation programs 2014-2020. And here we have very well um, process, uh, everything is going well. We have 24 projects within uh, Lithuania, Russia. Um, yes, within Lithuania, Russia program and uh, 14 projects within uh, Poland, Russia, uh, cross-border cooperation program for today. And I may say that I have, <coughs> I got new kind of cooperation. It's not a Euro region, it's not a cross-border region, as we have no cross-border region as it is, because we are divided by a border, and a border is the main obstacle to our cooperation. But um, a project cooperation might be a new form of cooperation mm -hmm. between the Kaliningrad mm -hmm. region and uh, exactly Lithuania and Poland bordering regions on the Kaliningrad region. We have a project cooperation. If there are funds, we have a project and we have good cooperation. If the funds are limited, it is very difficult to find a partner even on the other side of the border or who has no funds, enough funds to join, for example, a project. And um, in this case, we can say about uh, um, obstacles to uh, development of cross-border cooperation. Uh, but today, I may say that we have uh, launched, uh, as, I, as I have already said, uh, several international projects with Poland and Lithuania, and we are successful in the area that does not include international uh, events or international travel. So we can go uh, to Poland or Lithuania, but here we implement all activities jointly with our partners. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, our, our recent research with Professor Joanna Korowska uh, revealed uh, that um, over past two, three years, the cooperation with uh, Poland and Lithuania a little bit decreased, but not uh, because of COVID pandemic, but because of um, um, 
administrative barriers, language barriers, okay, and and so on. But we are we are very uh, optimistic, and we are working every day to support our cooperation. I, I will I will. <laughs> Julia, you you have said the most important issues. And, and we don't know <laughs> to keep keep you with microphone now. <laughs> so 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 we, we we know your opinion, but you, you raised one very important issue, and I would like to ask the, to raise that issue to all my pan panelists. What do you think? What will happen if funds uh, 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 disappear? Because because uh, uh, <laughs> Aldo gave gave us uh, examples. They don't have European Union funds, but they have cro co cross border cooperation. What do you think? What 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 will happen now, if if if, if Interreg disappears? Yeah. Oh, Marcia, I have one question. Uh, do you yeah. mean a European fund or? Yes, I I, I I mean I mean European if if European funds the, uh, or in general, disappear. In general. <laughs> <laughs> Who will finance uh, administration of your regions? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we have to we have to work on uh, increasing uh, a business capital to uh, reinforce our investment for regional development activities, right? And uh, now uh, it's a challenge to um, enhance the cooperation um, in innovation and research development processes to have uh, innovative procedures for the next uh, future without funds we have to we have to think about that i think that it's a, a good uh, a good challenge for uh, all all actors key actors of the regional mm -hmm. development as well um, yeah i had prepared something like uh, to strengthen uh, cooperation of uh, visegrad group uh, b4 plus yeah, and, that's that's uh, a good example. Mm -hmm. And uh, Western Balkan countries uh, and Eastern Partnership uh, of their uh, enlargement possibility to to follow the European Union, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, it will be very different. I can um, I don't know, I don't know how to help uh, to uh, the law. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a, a good question. I think that we have to be optimist uh, that we are looking for the next period of European funding uh, to the uh, new period uh, 2021 to 2027. So I think that the future is more optimistic than you mean, Tomasz. Okay. okay. Tomasz, maybe we will uh, try to remember those times when we had no European funds yeah and what kind of cooperation was at that time and maybe we <laughs> we can imagine how to return to those kinds of cooperation at that times when people uh, took money from your own funds or from the regional or local authority funds and uh, did this work mm -hmm. and everything was okay mm, but but i was very young and okay yes uh, I'm reflecting this option for Kosovo now, uh, that uh, the Visegrad group is identifying and challenging the main industries there and in the Western Balkan countries as well. And uh, the whole analysis it, uh, was about this, uh, that uh, the Visegrad group countries uh, are, are helping to uh, this kind of enlargement and uh, uh, their integration to the European Union as well. So. Uh, yeah, and uh, those politics um, are are identifying the main industries in Eastern Partnership countries as a demographic development, economy and technology, information and digital, mm -hmm. as well the energy and environment. Uh, moreover, these challenges will shape uh, the direction of policy discussion of the Eastern Partnership countries and the cooperation between Chegrad and Western Balkan countries has established closer relations between those two groups and has delivered numerous business opportunities and social and economic funds for social, political and uh, economic assistance to Western Balkan countries as well. 
Can you, uh, can, you, is, uh, can, you can you, can you, can you, can you just keep, keep, keep this map? Uh, you, you I'm see, <laughs> you see, you see this, uh, this free. No, no, no. G give, give, give this map again. Yeah. You again. see, you see. Yes, you see the, those four countries. That 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 is Visegrad group. But the audit value of the cooperation is that it's a perfect example of creating cross-border destination. Cross-border mm -hmm. destination that. For example, when you when you promote you promote this as Central Europe, and it's becoming very attractive for tourists outside Europe because when, when they come, they can visit the the, the, the whole whole uh, four uh, uh, countries. There are several tour operators that are pre pre preparing their 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 products. So it means that there is the real enthusiasm about cross border cooperation and. And maybe it's transnational cooperation, but, but it's, it's also similar also, because it's like cross-border, but it's a little bit bigger. So, so, so this is one of the examples that, that instead of European Union, there is a small, you know, this Visegrad fund. <laughs> but but it's, it's created by national authorities. So I think it's a, it's a good example that it's working. And what, what, what do you think? <laughs> Andre, what what will happen? If, yeah, but well, I think I would like to talk so, so something to get into a point which is totally different. But let's uh, finish this one first. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Um, what will be when the money will uh, end? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there was a uh, your original book, for example, uh, was very important where it uh, managed the um, umbrella project of micro projects. And uh, when it's finished, there was no money that was distributed by the euro region. Uh, we've got the situation that month by month, some county is leaving your region because they do not see any sense of belonging to this structure. But on the other hand, we've got this process of decomposition and maybe recomposition because the, uh, we've got this uh, uh, Eurogen book uh, which is disintegrating. And on the other hand, at the same place, we've got uh, new initiatives of creation of Eurogen Przeburze and Eurogen Rostocze, much smaller much better tailored to the problems that, that they have to, have to uh, tackle with. And I think that if the money, the funds would end for cross-border cooperation, we would come back to the situation from the, uh, uh, from the 90s, let's say, when the cross-border cooperation existed, but this cross-border cooperation would be prioritized because still cross-border problems w and changes would remain. Yeah, the problems will not disappear. Yes, yeah, and, exactly. and we would have to manage these problems. Mm -hmm. to, to, so I think that the cross-border corruption would maintain, but it would be prioritized, and uh, this would be uh, uh, dealing with the most important issues. And I would like to follow up on this and, and uh, also go back to uh, Professor Rückert's uh, interesting presentation because it demonstrates very much I have heard at the ABS conference in San Diego uh, last year there was another presentation about a cross-border city between Brazil and Uruguay I think or Brazil Argentina I don't remember the name uh, but it was so um, fantastic to see how many flexible solutions they they found they had a joint fire brigade system which we do not have in any euro region in europe so um it is i think it is much more about the border regime because you demonstrated that very well um, that suddenly with covid 19 and the border closures things fall apart whereas the euro regions as a framework and and interreg interreg is nice to give uh, you can get some money but everybody is complaining it's so bureaucratic and uh, and when i do not think anybody has ever made a, co a comprehensive evaluation of uh, interreg 10 years after like what ha look at a project which was funded in interreg 3 which ran from uh, 90 was it 9, 8, 2000 2007 I think or something like this we are in five now yes um, and and then what what look at this what is there what is left five six seven years after my fear is that in 80 percent you will find out nothing is left and and this uh, demonstrates again that uh, that uh, the motivation to get funding uh, 
uh, it, you, then you do a project, but then the funds go away, nobody wants to continue, which means that apparently there is no real interest. Or at least the inter or it's not profitable enough. Whereas when you look at, at this uh, more flow-oriented approach, you will find that, and this is also what, um, what our colleague from Prague, Gabriela, what, what you mentioned, then, then there, is a, uh, there is a much more concrete interest and profit, and you have a selection that you look at issues where you can actually cooperate on the long term because there is a profit and a gain. I mean, logistics is a good example from our region. They have had an interreg project actually some years ago. I think it was in, in Interreg 3. And uh, I met one, uh, one meeting that was one of the German partners. Yeah, but what is really happening? Nothing is really doing. What we have now, five years or 10 years after, is that all the German logistics in the border region have been taken over by Danish companies. So there has been a profit there because uh, the market became more clear to, to the actors. And then the Danish companies took their competitive advantage and, and uh, took over the German companies. Um, and we have our region is a cross-border logistics center now, so there is a clear benefit. Uh, if you look at it from a national perspective, it can be a little bit touchy because it's now it's the small country that took over the big country, actually. Um, but I think if the money will disappear from Interreg, of course, many things will not happen. Many nice things will not happen. We will not have a cross-border bike route anymore. We will not have kindergarten exchange and these nice things. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, it, and this depends very much on the border regime. And this is when we get back at internal, external border regions. It's not so important. Internal border regions, of course, have a, a border regime, at least when we do not have a pandemic, uh, which makes it much easier to cooperate but doesn't mean that everything is possible. Uh, whereas on the external borders of the EU, we have uh, perhaps very good incentives. I mean, there is a strong interest, I assume, from the neighborhood countries to get closer to the EU, uh, which then gives a lot of opportunities to cooperate. But of course, it depends very much on the border regime. How open is the border? How can people move? Can goods move freely? Mm -hmm. OK. Um Unfortunately, we are going to the end of this round table. So, so, so I would like to raise, raise the, the last question. Do you think that the cross-border cooperation at external, in, internal and, and out, outside Europe is different? Do you find, do you, because we, we, we have seen like, for example, Brazil. We have seen the European Union. How, how, how do you find? Is there something common in this cross-border cooperation? And what are the, the differences? Should I start again? Because it, 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 the, the, what is in common is uh, um, that uh, it depends on flows. It depends on actors' willingness to do something across the border. Uh, and uh, the difference is, of course, that uh, in, within the EU uh, and on the external borders of the EU, we have indirect. I mean, there's a possibility to get public funds okay. if you have a good idea, or if, even if you just have a decent idea, because the competition uh, process in Interreg, as far as I know, is not that difficult. It's, it's actually one of the easiest funds of the EU to get money from. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, I, so Interreg, so the difference? I absolutely, absolutely agree with that, and um, only I would like to add something. I, I'm not sure whether this is true, but observing the cross-border cooperation uh, in, in within the European Union and outside the European Union, I think that the outside of the European Union there is a stronger role of uh, regional authorities and national authorities in cross-border cooperation, whether within the European Union the local communities uh, plays more important role in this aspect. And, and uh, Julia, uh, you, your country has the biggest number of neighbors. <laughs> and, and, and it's so interesting that, that it's the unique country that has so many so different borders. Because, because it's very difficult to compare the cooperation between uh, Russia and Lithuania. And I have al 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 already been, been the reviewer of the uh, cross-border cooperation between Russia and China, which, which you, you will agree that that probably is completely different. 
that in, yes. in, in, uh, I will, uh, in, in Euro Europe we have Euro regions and maybe in Asia you will have Asia regions. Yes, but we have, as far as I remember, seven cross-border cooperation programs uh -huh. uh, that I know, but I have little, I have little knowledge about China-Russia cooperation. Of course. <laughs> yeah, but there is no there is no interact, but it's working. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I'm living uh, near I'm live I'm living near Europe, and I know more about Europe European cooperation uh -huh. of Russia. So, but uh -huh. I think the difference is in uh, um, networking in uh, European Union inside the European Union. It is easier to establish that ne this networking mm -hmm. between between organizations. And in, in Russia, with our partners, it is difficult because we have language barriers and people, as we say, from regional and local authorities, from small towns, they, mm, they don't have uh, a lot of uh, human resources to manage these projects mm -hmm. because of lack of knowledge, administrative uh, barriers and uh, lack of knowledge in law, how to manage this project and it's the main problem mm -hmm. so. thank you thank you very much for european now we we have really the last minute i w <laughs> I, I would like to 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 pass the open question to my panel panelists would you like to say something because it's not only the uh, end of, of this round table it's the end of the conference <laughs> <laughs> so so maybe maybe the, the guests outside here would like to comment the, the future. One optimistic vision uh, that before emphasized that the Eastern Partnership countries uh, should have a clear political narrative, a new strategic vision, and an architecture that guarantees joint ownership of European institutions, member states, and partner countries, mm -hmm. including uh, the free trade area is the main achievement for the EAP for further development and operating into European Union. So I, I hope to be uh, with, uh, of, of the enlargement of the, uh, of the new partners in this kind of community and, and strengthening uh, digital transformation now in this, <laughs> in this situation and to be in touch with our Polish colleagues, uh, uh, Brazilian colleagues, German colleagues, uh, and all colleagues uh, from the conference. Thank you, thank you very much. And and is there anyone else who would like to or, or to say something? Uh, may I? Okay, please, please, Krista. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, as you said uh, before, um, I was optimistic, and I still optimistic, and I I think we have to be optimistic. Uh, I think we have to develop uh, to deepen cross border cooperation. Uh, we have uh, two units uh, to uh, develop a new uh, common uh, instruments, common uh, programs uh, to face all the challenges uh, we, uh, which uh, will uh, appear uh, in, uh, in the future. So I, I think that uh, we have to be optimistic. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. I was very honored to be the moderator of this round table, but there is one very, very set point in agenda called conference closing. <laughs> conference <laughs> closing. So, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I am in the situation that I would like to thank you all, I would say, all participants, the participants who were able to come here, but also the persons who found time, who, who, who joined with, with the knowledge, with the experience. And I think that the conference was, was prepared perfectly, was, was prepared very well. I would like to congratulate the whole, the whole group, everyone who was engaged starting with our very good friend, Professor Joanna kuroska Pisch, who was the initiator of this nice event. I would like to thank you, all members of the scientific committee, 
and all, of course, all members of the organi or, or organizing committee. And I think that this is not the last conference. I think that we have to be optimists, and as the conference must be ended, I would like to say my personal last, last sentence. We have to believe the wind of change will come and it will take the virus out. <laughs> and we have to believe that the cross-border cooperation will, will, will be still very good and will develop even if the time is not, not very, well, very well at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And have a good Thank time. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And, and good health to everyone. Yes, thank you very much for you too.